Good evening and welcome to our show. This is the Word and Sword TV broadcast coming to you from WHKY Studios in Hickory, North Carolina. I'm Stan Adams, your speaker, and uh, we want you to know that we are so glad that you've invited us in your home tonight. We hope that you will follow us along as we go through our study of God's Word together. Get your Bibles out and make sure that what we're teaching is from God's Word and make certain that we are teaching the truth. If we are not, you would be most welcome to call us and let us know if we're teaching error. We don't want to do that. And uh, we don't want to lead you astray. Uh, preaching the gospel and learning God's Word is very serious. And we don't want to presume to teach you something that's not provable from God's Word. So uh, give us a call tonight. 828-485-5555 is the number. That's 828-485-5555, and that will be scrolling throughout the broadcast at the bottom right-hand corner of your TV screen. Call operators are standing by. This is a live show, not one something you don't find much today, but this is a live show, and uh, call with your questions. If you will, Bible questions, you can call to ask for a free copy of this presentation. Also, we want to stress that everything we offer on this program is free of charge. There is no charge for anything. Do not send us any money. This program is funded entirely from the Newton Church of Christ, and uh, we are most glad to be able to come into your home. The program, I believe, has been on since the middle 70s or maybe a little later than that, but um, it is the oldest uh, TV broadcast or religious broadcast that WHKY has, and uh, we are pretty proud of that. We have a good relationship with WHKY, and we hope to continue this as long as we can to continue to preach and teach God's Word together. And we would uh, count it an honor if you would continue to watch us, and we thank you, every one of you who has been watching the program and participating in the program. We appreciate it so much, both your agreement and your disagreement. The program is yours as much as ours as we interact in, on the program. And you can also call and ask for a free Bible correspondence course. Now, a correspondence course, that's an old name, but it is a name that uh, used to be something where we would mail it out. But it simply is a Bible course. That's all it is. It's a Bible course of study, and it leads you in, a, in the direction of just basic understanding of God's Word. It, uh, one of the programs that we have, one of the courses we have, is uh, about 13 lessons, and uh, you can fill that out online if you would like. And also we have one that we can still mail to you if you would like that. But any, at any rate, uh, get in the Word of God and study it. Don't just read it, but study God's Word. And uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. Also, you can ask for a free tract. Now, a tract is nothing in the world but a printed gospel sermon. That's all it is. And we have a number of different subjects. You call and let us know what Bible subject you'd like to hear about, and we'll give you extensive information on that subject from many different sources, but uh, all from the Bible. And so we would ask you to do that. You can call and ask for a map to the building uh, to come and worship with us at the Newton Church of Christ, or you can ask to be added to the Beacon mailing list, which is the uh, monthly publication of the Newton Church of Christ, and it's mailed out quarterly. If you'd like to be added to that, please call and let us know that tonight. You can also arrange a personal Bible study <clears throat> many times People just have questions that require more than just a few answer, a few few minutes to answer. And we would like to meet with you if you'd like that in your home or whatever. We would always come two by two in that and not just meet with you by yourself. Uh, if you'd like to meet in a public place, we understand that in today's society as it is. So we understand that and we appreciate that very much. But we would be glad to just meet with you and have a Bible study with you. We have several members that will be willing to do that www.wordandsword.com is the uh, website, and if you would like to uh, avail yourself of that website, we're going to go ahead and put that up here on the chart, on the screen, if you will. www.wordandsword.com, and you can call with a biblical question or comment and receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer. Uh, tonight, hopefully, if you want to call in, and if we're not able to answer your question sufficiently from God's Word, we'll not try to fool you. We'll just let you know that we'll get back with you, and we will get back with you on whatever question you may have. 
Also, you can like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword and also at www.facebook.com slash Newton, North Carolina, Church of Christ. And you can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. Post questions there and we'll get back with you on that. Once again, it's all about knowing what God's Word says, studying what God's Word says, reading what God's Word says, and applying what God's Word says. We want to be doers of God's Word and not just hearers. And so that's the design of all these things that we're offering. Also, the number again to call tonight, the show is going on right now. If you'd like to call, 828-485-5555. The Assemblies of the Newton Church of Christ, uh, the church first of all meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Uh, Bible study is at 930 on Sunday. Uh, 11 o'clock on, on uh, Sunday morning for, for our worship peer, for the worship period, and then Wednesday night at 7 p.m. I do want to make you aware, if you will, be careful of this. I do want to make everyone aware, and we'll come back to me on this, but this coming Sunday is when we set our clocks forward. So remember that. You might be a little late for services. So uh, set your clock forward for this coming Sunday. That's, uh, this is the time when we spring forward. And uh, go ahead and do that on Saturday night before you go to bed. And you'll lose an hour of sleep, but that'll be all right. Uh, you, you'll be able to, to function, no problem. But remember that. But the times of the services at Newton Church of Christ are 9.30 on Sundays and 11 o'clock on Sunday, then 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And also, the Newton Church of Christ is having a gospel meeting we'll get to in just a moment. But the Word and Sword is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. And we want to make sure that you know that this is all funded by the Newton Church of Christ. Contact them at, by email at contact at wordandsword.com and by phone at 828-465-3009. And uh, call the building, leave a message. If you need a ride in any way, need any type of transportation to the, to the church building, we'll be glad to uh, send somebody out to get you. You can contact the Newton Church of Christ by mail by just going to P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And again, the website is www.wordandsword.com. The Newton Church of Christ will be having a gospel meeting March the 22nd through the 27th. The speaker will be Stephen Montz or Steve Montz from over in Kentucky, and we would uh, want to, the church wants to invite you to be a part of that work. Um, he's going to speak on Sunday morning in the Bible class period on Moses, the making of a great leader. At the worship services at 11 o'clock, he'll speak on Moses, excuses, excuses, excuses. And then Monday at 7 o'clock p.m., that's the evening services throughout the week, he'll speak on just so long as you're sincere. Good, good, uh, material there, I'm sure. And then on Tuesday, he'll speak on digital dangers, very appropriate subject for today's society. Then on Wednesday, he'll speak on 10 years from now. Good, good thing to think about in view of what we've been talking about on this program. Where will you be 10 years from now, I'm sure. And then Thursday, withstanding idolatry. Many times we don't think that we are idol worshipers, but oftentimes we find out, sadly, that we are don't have to have an image to have an idol. And also on Friday night the meeting will conclude with our God, He is alive. And then after that, if you would like, there's a, there's a lot of gospel preaching going on in the area. And after the meeting at Newton, we want to make you aware of, an, of a meeting that's going on for the uh, 27th through the 29th. It will overlap a little bit, go to the Newton uh, meeting, and then on Saturday come on over and be with the Lincoln Church with Connie Adams doing the speaking on Saturday and, and Sunday. And uh, that service will conclude with the singing uh, for, from three to four, and also will conclude with uh, uh, 4.30 services with Brother Connie speaking to us on his last one. He's 90 years old, by the way. So many people in this area know him, and he's been at the Newton Church of Christ before, and we wanted to make everyone aware of that. And then also, if you will, on the 20th through the 20th, 19th through the 22nd, the church at Tryon Street in Charlotte is having a gospel meeting also. Their services are at 7.30 each night, and church services at, uh, at Newton and at Lincoln will be 7 o'clock each night, except for Sunday. 
So if you will avail yourself of these many opportunities to come and hear God's Word being taught. The sustaining of God's Word is, and the preaching of God's Word is beautiful all over the place, anywhere it's done. And then there'll be another meeting at Spruce Pine in April, and uh, you want to be able to go up to that. So it's meeting time, and so springtime is when everybody has their meetings, and we want to let you know of all the meetings we know of in the area. And uh, please go and support those meetings and the preaching of the gospel. That's what it's all about. The gospel's being preached and support that if you will. Well, I want to make you aware of some changes that are coming to the program. Many of you have been watching the program uh, for some time. Many of you have been watching it for over 20 years and we're glad that you're doing that and thank you for that. But we want to make you aware that as has happened in uh, uh, eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, um, I came to the program. I followed uh, John Cripps, who had been on the program for 14 years. I've been on this program for eight and a half, almost nine years now, and it is time to make another change. And the Newton Church of Christ will be making a change in the speaker. Uh, I'm now working with the Lincoln Church of Christ over in Lincolnton, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, the work there is going well, the work at Newton is going well. And I've been doing this program for a while while the church at Newton is securing another preacher. And Brother Stephen Deaton, who has been on this program, we, he has been in meetings at Newton, a very capable young man, a very capable gospel preacher. He will be doing the program here for the for the next for the next little while, and uh, we would like to to recommend him highly to you, and continue. He is going to preach the gospel. And he's going to preach the gospel just like we hope we have preached. Everyone brings their different style. Brother uh, Deaton is very polished. Brother Deaton is very very good speaker, and you will be benefited by listening to him as he presents God's word. And we have a little clip right now that we're going to play of Brother Deaton that he sent in to let you know who he is and what he's going to be doing. And so we give you that clip right now, and we'll come back in just a moment. Brother Deaton. My name is Stephen Deaton, and I'll be working with the Newton Church of Christ on the Word and Sword Bible Study Program. I plan to continue on in the same work that Stan Adams has done for many years in proclaiming the gospel of Christ and directing you to the Word of God as the sole and final authority in all things pertaining to our beliefs and practices. I will also appeal to you to submit to the Lord in your life that you may have fellowship with Him. We will also use the sword of the Spirit to defend the gospel of Christ against the doctrines and commandments of men. Some of the changes you'll notice about the TV program is the new studio that we'll be in, but also we plan to have shorter segments during the program focused on specific topics and covering multiple topics in each program. We also want to encourage you to go to our Facebook page to submit questions in addition to using the phone number to call in and to ask questions or sending questions via email. Something I want to do, though, before I leave you is to leave you with this thought. Did you know that you can understand the Word of God, the will of God, as the Apostle Paul understood the Word of God? In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He says, you can understand like I understand. But there are a lot of people these days who don't think we can understand the Bible. They think it's too confusing, it's too complex, it's too difficult. There are others who think, well, certain people can understand the Bible, maybe certain religious leaders, and they need to tell us what the Word of God says. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you and I can understand the Word of God just like the Apostle Paul did. When you think about it, God loves the whole world. He loves every man. He loves every woman. He loves every child. And because God loves us, he wants us to be redeemed. And the way we know how to be redeemed, the way that we would come to know him and have a relationship with him is by knowing his will. And so he revealed his will in a way that we can understand it in his providence. He has protected it down through the centuries and seen that it spread 
all over the world in the languages that men speak. We have it in our language that we can know and understand the will of God. Because again, God loves us and God wants us to be redeemed. And so I encourage you to read your Bible daily. Study it, meditate upon it, and live by it. And also join us here on the first and third Tuesdays of the month from 8 to 10 p.m. as we study the Word of God, that we may study it together and understand the will of God. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to studying with you. Thank you, Brother Deaton. And you can see from this presentation that Brother Deaton is bringing his style to the program. But the beautiful thing about it, folks, is no matter what somebody says or what style they use, that is the scriptural style, the focus of brother, both Brother Deaton's preaching and the preaching of anyone that will be on this program is going to be centered around the Word of God. We'll not be giving you our opinions or our think-sos. We'll be giving you what the Bible says. And I've known Brother Deaton for many years. We are friends, and I appreciate him so much for his work. And it will be a delight and a treat for you to be able to have him on this program. And uh, we do encourage you to tune in and call your friends to tune in also. Uh, we are going now going to go to our program tonight. And again, the most important question, even that Brother Deaton just mentioned, is what must I do to be saved? Submitting yourself to God. What are you going to be doing? Have you submitted your entire will to God? Not have you given Him part of yourself, but have you obeyed His plan? You know, the God that we serve is a God of details. If you think about it, God uh, knows the very hairs of our head, how many hairs we have on our head and how many sands are in the sea. That's detail. The sun coming up, the sun going down, detail. The sun being made, the sun, the moon being made, details that God does and sustains nature, the seasons, all of those details. And God has steps that He has not only for nature, not only for the natural things, but also for us. And God has a step by step plan on how to be saved. He has told us sincerely how we, what we need to do in order to please Him. We are not in the dark as to how to please God. He that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So we ask the question on our last, my last program with you for a while, and uh, that is this, the plan of salvation. What have you done to be saved? And go to the chart if you will. Hearing the gospel is absolutely essential, Romans 10, 17, because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Listen to God's Word. Hear what it says and do it. We are to hear the Lord, not to hear men. Believe the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. We are all children of God, Galatians 3.26, through faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 10.10, 10, we know that with heart man believes unto salvation. So we believe, and Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am He, you'll all die in your sins. Also, we must repent in order to be pleasing to God. Except we repent, we'll all perish. Times of this ignorance, Acts 17, verse 30, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to come to repentance. Change the way you're living. Turn, turn from the sinful things you've done. In Acts 2, 38, they had crucified Jesus. They were to turn from their wicked doubting ways and come and turn to God. Many did, 3,000 on that day. And they were baptized for remission of their sins. We know that confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is essential. For Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 through 6, we see that baptism is commanded. It is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know in Galatians 3.27 that we put Christ on in baptism, and that baptism does save us. Both Mark 16.16 16 and 1 Peter 3.21 teach that. So all of these are necessary for our salvation. No one more than the other, but in order to be saved we must do all of these. And the one final step that puts us into Christ is baptism. 
We are led to Christ through hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing. But one step puts us into Christ. That's where we receive the blood, and that is in the waters of baptism. Water baptism is an essential, and God has given us that plan. It's not my plan. It's not the Newton Church of Christ plan. It's the Bible plan for how to go to heaven. Have you done it? Have you pleased the Lord by submission to His plan? Now, if we fulfill these commandments, we'll be saved, and the Lord will add you to His church. In Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Those who were being saved are those who had followed His commands in the previous things we've just covered. And then they were bound to worship in the Lord's body, the one church that He talked about in Matthew 16 and verse 18 that He would build. And they were expected to serve God faithfully unto death, just like we are today. We can depart from God. Once we are in Christ, we can depart. That's up to us. Just like it was on us to, to obey Him or not to obey Him, it is still on us to continue to obey Him or to go our way. Going to the funeral of a very good friend on, on uh, Thursday, who served God for many, many, many years. Did a lot of good in the kingdom of the Lord. Very faithful in service for many years. Over 40 years he was faithful. And then one day he decided he was done. He walked away from God. Was he ever saved? Yes. Did he depart? Yes. And we hope and pray that God will have mercy on him in whatever way he can that's in accordance with his will. But we know that the last time we saw him, he had forgotten the Lord. And he was not the least bit interested in coming back to the Lord. Folks, it's possible for good, good people to walk away from God. I pray that you'll pray that I won't ever do that. Somebody says, well, you're older. You won't never do that. Older people have left the Lord. It happens. People fall away and leave God. The man I'm talking about is 69. And people do leave the Lord. They get tired. They get weary. And they get jaded. They get cynical sometimes. And they walk away from the one who loves them and from the one they have served for so long. That's sad, but it can happen. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. It can happen to anyone. So we need to guard ourselves to make sure that we continually examine our will with what God wants us to do. We've been talking about in the last few shows and tonight on the final, my final show with you, um, we're going to talk about the continued subject of the stages of our lives. And we're going to talk tonight, particularly starting tonight, with the midlife. Hear a lot about midlife now. Mostly what you hear midlife is the first part of an adjective that's used to describe a crisis. You know, people get midlife and they, they begin to think, oh no, life has passed me by. And they begin to want to act like a kid again. Well, that is not, that's, that's a myth that that has to happen. Uh, and it really has something to say with how we view our whole idea and our whole life. Notice what is said. I have seen the God-given task that which the sons of man are to be occupied. He's made everything, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Beautiful in its own time. Ecclesiastes 3, I'm sorry. And also, He has put eternity in their hearts except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice, to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all of his labor, for it is the gift of God. Friends, that's what life should be about, no matter what stage you're in. We've talked about being in the infant state, in the childhood state. We talked about being in the teen years, in the 20s. And now we're talking about perhaps the most productive part of a person's life, and that's the midlife area. Someone has said the midlife area is the most vital area of your whole life. For in that midlife period, you begin to accrue a little bit from what you've been doing. You put aside some things for years later. You're also sustaining yourself. You're putting your children through college. You have a lot of pressures, a lot of things to juggle. And if we're not careful during our midlife area, or during the mid-years, we'll get to a point where we have gotten so overwhelmed 
that we just want to quit everything if we're not careful. But notice that it's supposed to be, just like youth, a happy time. You have a choice. You can live a happy life or you can live a sad life. Somebody says, well, you don't know anything. Life is tough. I know that life is tough. I know that life has hard times. Difficulties come in so many different ways in these years, these midlife years. But we can just take it as we, as we need to, as God says, and enjoy whatever comes our way. And realize that if we continue, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that we will be happy. David said that the Lord was his rock and his salvation. And that was true all of David's life when he was a young man, when he slew Goliath, and when he was in, in a very dark place in his life. God was there for him when he turned to him. When he had dismissed God, he was never lonelier, and he said so. But he turned to God, and then he lived with God. And God was with him all the way through, through his older years and his younger years. So the midlife area is supposed to be an enjoyable time. Why is it that so many people have challenges with their midlife time? First of all, let's define what we're talking about with midlife. Well, at the age of 30, your midlife would be what? 15. Well, sometimes years ago in the, in the western part of our country, uh, there were several people that never lived to be 30. The lifespan in this country was much shorter. Uh, people grew up much quicker. Uh, there were many school teachers in the West that were 14 years old and had already been through school. Well, Billy the Kid, they say, was about 14 when he started doing all the horrible things he did. So you see, some of our pictures of how we think midlife is, they were not always that way. Well, if a person lives to be 100, then he starts midlife about 50 or 60. Well, midlife is the period after younger adulthood, or parent, well, mainly when we get into our parenting, the young years, and also prior to old age. It's that last uh, lap that we're getting, the uh, second, uh, well, about the middle part, the th uh, in a mile race, it would be the third and the fourth laps. That third lap would be the one that would be the one that would really t challenge us. If you've ever run a mile, you know that third lap is a tough one. The fourth one, you know what that is, you're about to end. But the third one's tough. You have to, it takes a lot of endurance, a lot of patience, and a lot of sucking it up and keep going. And that's pretty much what midlife can be sometimes as we go through. We have so many responsibilities. A man looks at his life and he says, this is overwhelming. Life has turned out different than what I ever imagined it to do. These are some of the thoughts that come into a person's head. Well, you look at your life and you say, well, I always intended to be a rocket scientist. And you never made it. And sometimes you can look back and waste your life by looking behind rather than enjoy yourself by looking ahead to the things that are waiting for you and to enjoy the things that you have right now. What was it in Ecclesiastes 3? He's made everything beautiful in its time. And we are to enjoy things. And midlife is a time, hopefully, that we begin to see some way that we can start catching our breath a little bit. Well, if a man reaches 40, Confucius said, and is disliked by his fellows, he'll be that way until he dies. That's a pretty negative way to look at midlife, isn't it? Well, the aging of the body begins. All of a sudden we realize we can't run a 10 flat 100. We can't uh, hit a ball all the way out of the park anymore. Uh, we can't throw a football as hard as we want to because we got a rotator cuff problem. Or we have knee issues and we start making sounds when we get up and when we sit down and uh, we have to begin to slow down. Now that doesn't mean stop. It just means there are some things happening to our bodies that are changing. And that can be, if we let it, we can be depressed over that. Or we can say, you know, I'm glad that I got up today and that I was able to breathe and that I'm able to hurt if, I, if, if that's what, it, what, what is there. Because when you're able to hurt, you know what that means? My grandmother said that means you're alive, you know? She had rheumatoid arthritis for over 30 years in the last years of her life. And she hurt all the time. But she said, son, if I don't get up, I won't get up. 
you know? And that's a good way to look at it. You just get up, and as my dad, who's turned 95 this year, says, you just breathe regularly. You put, breathe in and you breathe out, and you do that often and regularly, and you'll be alive. Well, it's a pretty good way to look at it. Now, do you have to have a little bit of a sense of humor to see that? Yeah, you do, and some people don't, sadly. Everything's doom and gloom for them, and they're looking at their midlife and wasting away those wonderful years by getting negative about the things that are happening. Well, Hercules in his midlife in, is quoted as saying, you begin, you begin better than you end. Your last deeds yield to your first ones. The man you are and the child you were are just not the same. Again, negative way of looking at it. The battle with cynicism comes in these years. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1, this is foretold because it says here, remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. You know, we don't want to grow cynical. Have you ever met a cynical old person? It's not very pretty, is it? They're just, nothing's good, and everything's bad, and you'll learn one day, young person, that it ain't all good, and you're just going to be really, you know, open your eyes. Well, we can be very discouraging to young people if we're not careful, because they look at us, I don't want to get to that, be that way. So we need to be more positive in our outlook and recognize that we have things to do in our lives. We're not done. God's not done with us. And so we just deal with life in the stage that we're in, and we realize that, as we always have, that we will pass from this life if we last uh, until the Lord comes back. He will take us or we will die. That's the way life is. That's the course of life. Never meant to stay here forever. What's the most important thing in midlife as well as any other time? Fearing God and keeping His commandments. Well, sometimes when we get into the midlife area, we're trying to also balance relationships, responsibilities that we have. And remember that in the midlife years is when most people in the body of Christ, particularly men, that God has ordained that they be what God said they should be as elders. If they have worked hard, and put the kingdom first in their life, all through their life. And we see that He has given particular qualifications for the men. We're going to talk about the women in just a minute in this time period. But on the book of Titus, if you have your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 1 and verse 6. And let's look at the qualifications of a godly man. In this case, it's going to be an elder. But really, these qualifications are the qualifications a man should have been working on for many, many years. And it, as you get to the time of your life, when you're in your late 40s, early 50s, 60s, 70s even, and into 80s, hopefully you're still vital and, and active and your mind is good, and you can serve the Lord as an elder in the body of Christ. Remember that no matter what stage of your life you find yourself, that you best please God when you are a servant. That's the highest, highest office anybody can ever have in the kingdom of the Lord. But notice in verse 6, 6, it's, he says here, if any be blameless, doesn't mean sinless, but it means that nothing can be thrown against you. That is something that will be believable. The husband of one wife, now that is an important thing right there. You should recognize that if you are married, and we've already talked about that in the other years, the younger years of adulthood, that we have chosen somebody that will help us go to heaven. And that one wife and us are working together to go to heaven together. This man is not to be accused of riot or unruly. He's a self-controlled man. What kind of man should you be? Well, again, these things should have been going on from a young time. But if not, we know that we can implement these things at any time. If you begin to look at your life and you realize that something is lacking, ask yourself what it is. Is it money? Is it popularity? Is it maybe your spiritual status before God? You begin to look and think about things in these years that perhaps you haven't thought of before. 
begin to reflect, what have I given God? I've served myself. I've done this. I've done that. My kids aren't around much anymore, and I'm all alone. And my wife and I, we speak occasionally, but we're, we're not really close, and something's missing. I've built my life on something different. If you begin to think that way, and you realize that your spiritual life is an absolute wreck, no matter what time of your life you realize that, you get it straight, and you fix that. He goes on and says, an elder or a bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine and not a striker, not given to filthy money, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober and just and holy and temperate, holding the faithful word as he's been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convince the gainsayer. This is a knowledgeable man. And he says, uh, you need to be able to stop the mouths of those that are teaching error. So this is a man that has been able to so order his life through the different stages of his life to where he has been pleasing to God all the way through. And that he is now ready to serve God in the capacity of being an elder in the body of Christ. But notice with all of those things that were mentioned, these are just basic characteristics of good people in the world, good men and good women. I'm going to read a, read a few passages to you and uh, just submit them to you. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 2, a good man will obtain favor from the Lord but he will condemn a man who devises evil. Ecclesiastes 7, there is not a righteous man on the earth who continually does good and never sins. What that says is not a license for you to sin. It just says that you need God and you need forgiveness. The sin issue needs forgiveness, doesn't it? Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, Paul tells Timothy, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And that's true. And then we see the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his paths. In midlife, you have all these plans made. Maybe you've made plans to travel. Maybe you've made plans to vacation and go to this place or that place. Maybe you are getting out of paying for the kids' school now and you're going to devote some of your funds in a different direction. All of that's okay. But it must be directed by the Word of God and what God wants you to do. And He wants you to continue to seek His kingdom first and not yourself. And that's a challenge sometimes. Some people retire as they get into this time in their life and they say, I'm, I'm going to use all this time for myself. And that's not what God wants. In Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. So the godly man in his midlife will understand and, under, and say very clearly, I am going to continue to serve God. Or if you've never served God and you reach your midlife time, you stop, you take inventory of where you are, and you change the course of your life. You can do that at any point of your life. Do you know that? You can change courses. You can change jobs. People do it all the time, don't they? They can adjust. This old idea, you can't teach old people new tricks? Yes, you can. How many old people know how to use a cell phone now? Well, see, that was a big one, wasn't it? Know how to use a computer, and you said you never would, see? Said you'd never get away from your flip phone, and now you've got a smartphone. Or like, you're, like me, you may have an Android, which my granddaughter calls a dumb phone. But you have learned to change, and you can change. God has fashioned us to be that way. The relationships you see, your relationship with your wife, have you built a relationship in your midlife that is sustained by a partnership? Or are you and your wife just two people who have been raising children, and that's all you've had in common? If that's the case, you need to redevote yourself to one another. You need to be more than two people passing at the front door and waving at one another on the way to your pursuits. That's no way to live your life. Your wife of your youth is to rejoice, you're to rejoice with her. She is a partner to you. 
you have a job to do together in the kingdom far beyond the mere rearing of your children and getting them through school and college. You have a job to do. And that job is to love one another. And to realize that if that starts falling apart, the children are going to be hurt by it. And that can happen, and it does happen, in all too many cases, when people begin to act selfish during these times. Responsibilities that you have can overwhelm you. A man looks at his life and he says, I've got to do this and I've got to do that, and everybody's dependent on this and dependent on that, and the boss wants this, the boss wants that, the wife wants these things, the children want these things. Everybody's pulling at me and I don't know what to do. I'm just tired. I just want to get away. These are things that Satan throws at us during these times. And rather than look at responsibilities as honors, we begin to look upon them as burdens. And we want to get away. We want to run. Well, understand that there is a time for us to get off to ourselves. The Lord did that while He was here. You remember how He would push away from the crowd when things began, began to be getting too much for Him? And He needed some alone time. He had the, the ability, He had the wisdom to know that He had to regather Himself so He could serve others. And so He would do that in the flesh. It wasn't a weakness He had. It was just the way the course of life is. And you need to recognize that sometimes you need alone time. And that alone time is best served with the one who loves you the most, and that's God. To where you get away and you talk with your God, and you, you commune with Him, and you just talk with Him and, and, and listen to what His Word says to you, and you kind of refresh yourself and get yourself rebooted to where you're better able to serve. When those responsibilities begin to weigh too heavy on you, go talk with your Lord. Go spend some time with your master. And also those that God has given you, your wife, you and her get away and work together. If those, if those relationships are getting shaky, you work at them again. And you shore them up. You don't run from them. You don't look for the nearest way out. You recognize that the wife of your youth is the one you have chosen. And you build that relationship as you should. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, go ahead. And if you don't, just look on the screen if you will. The renewal of the inward man is talked about by Paul. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, he says, Therefore we don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. As you begin to look at your life in these years and realize that vitality is not what it once was, or maybe there's some challenges with your health from time to time, things are happening that you never imagined, genetics are catching up with you, recognize that the outward man it was never meant to last forever anyway. Get perspective, understand, like Paul did, that maybe you've got a thorn in the flesh. That will never be removed, you'll just have to live with it and then live with it and rejoice. And Paul ended up learning to do that. That Satan gave that thing to him to try to defeat him, and he used it rather to glorify God. And that's what we must do today also. Notice this term, perishing. Our outward man is perishing. That's the Greek word that's up there when used in reference to material things. It refers to decay and wearing away. Our bodies are wearing away. Our bodies are moving down, the physical and the carnal things that we have in, in the body, the tent we live in, is going to go away. What moths do to clothing or rust does to metal is what this term perishing that Paul uses with the outward, outer man, just what he means by that. Our bodies are running down and they are not going to last forever. The inward man, however, is being renewed day by day. What is that inward man? That's the spiritual part of us. That's the part that's going to spend eternity with God. Our inward man. We're building that stronger, building it much stronger. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 14 and 15, Beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. So the Lord wants us all to be saved. He's long-suffering to us in that way. 
And He wants us to be diligent so that we'll be found in Him the people we should be. And we should look forward to doing that. Ask yourself, are you looking forward to tomorrow? What is your life today? <clears throat> James asked that question in James 4. What is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. What are you doing with your life? What is the most important thing you could do with your life? That's serve God, isn't it? The most important thing. Have you chosen to serve the Lord? Have you chosen the best part of life? For when a person walks with God, he never walks alone. In Acts chapter, Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> Paul says this, God be for us, verse 37 through 39, who can be against us? If God's for you, why would you worry about anything in this world? Because the Lord's on your side and you're a majority everywhere you go. So you can put up with all the responsibility. You can put up with the relationship issues. You can put up with all the juggling you have to do during this time period of your life. And you can do it all by putting God first. God promised you in Matthew 6, 33, if you seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, that all these things shall be added to you. You'll be able to function. You'll be able to function in this life and function very well. In 2 Peter 3, verses 17 and 18, 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall, here again, the person that's righteous can fall, from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So one of the beautiful things that happens during the midlife is your maturity begins to show. Your wisdom begins to show if you have set yourself to know wisdom. You've learned a few things with life. You've learned you made some mistakes. Someone says, well, God could keep me from making mistakes if He really loved me. I had a man tell me that one time. Let me ask you something. You learned to walk one day, didn't you? Your child if you have children, you watched your children take a first step. When they fell, did you tell them to quit trying to walk? No, you got them up and said, go again. And then they may have fallen again. They may have hurt themselves in that fall. Did you tell them then, don't try this ever again. It's dangerous. Don't do this. You didn't, did you? Why? Because those falls work toward getting back up. You, if you're at midlife in your life, you have learned that sometimes life beats you. Life hits you hard and you stumble, but you get up. You do not stay down. You're better than that and you keep getting up. That's what God wants you to do. You may be watching tonight and maybe you're one like one of the people that's called over the years and I want to hear from Matt if you're watching tonight, Matt, call and you know who you are, and give me a call. Matt was at a low point in his life when he first started watching this program. And he found that he needed to get up. And he didn't need to just fold to the defeats of life. So he got up, and he kept getting up. And life would keep knocking him down, and he'd keep getting up. I hope you're still up, Matt. And I hope you're still doing the things you should. But understand that as long as we are getting up from the blows that Satan throws at us, we're still in the fight, folks. And in midlife, we need to learn that. We have learned that, hopefully, through a series of both victories and mistakes that we've made. And hopefully, God has sustained us to this point without much harm to us, and we are in a right relationship with Him. And we're able to look back at those falls and warn other people not to go the way we did, to warn our children, to warn those that are older, and to speak with wisdom. We're going to talk about old age in just a moment, when people are supposed to have gotten to a point where people, they have a certain degree of respect, and they are teaching others of the things that they need to know about life. And so that's what we're developing when we're in midlife. And if a man is an elder in the body of Christ, he has developed a degree of maturity 
in spiritual things to where he not only can, has been living it himself, but he can instruct you in how to live it. And he can tell you of the right ways and the wrong ways and do so with conviction because he has set his heart to serve the Lord and he has put the Lord first in what he has done. In Psalm 30, 37 and verse 33, 23, he says there, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. So God delights in the ways of a righteous man, a good man. And a good man is not what man, man says he is. A good man is what God defines him as. You are defined by God how? As good or evil, and that's it. Are you a good man? Are you a good person? Someone says, well, you've been talking about the men a lot. What about me? I'm a woman listening tonight, and I'm in midlife, and things are changing for me. I'm not in childbearing years anymore, and I'm not, uh, there's a lot of things I'm going through. A lot of depressions confront me, and I'm having difficulties wanting to learn how to navigate life. Well, you know, the Lord has some answers for that. He is so ordered that women understand that they have some responsibilities. And the Lord has told the women in Titus, He has told them, the older women, to teach the younger women and to teach them how to live their lives. What type of life should a, should a midlife woman be? What type of person should she be? Well, notice in Titus chapter 2, speak the things that become sound doctrine that the aged men be sober, grave and temperate, sound in faith and charity and peace, and that aged women be in behavior as becomes holiness, that they may teach the younger women, verse 4. Younger women, where is the best place to get advice? From older, wise women. Not just older women, but older, wise women. If you're a middle-aged woman tonight, you sit and you find you a mentor that's a godly, older woman. And you take your problems to her. You talk to her. And the, she, she, if she's what she should be as a, as a person of God, she will certainly be able to guide you in the things that confront you. We live in a world today, and I want you to just read this. The older women are to teach the young women to be sober. That means to be serious-minded, to recognize that you enjoy your life but you have a seriousness that you're supposed to have about it. You're not only trying to go to heaven yourself, you're trying to help your husband, you're trying to help your children and to guide them to go to heaven. Those are tough times. Those things can be overwhelming sometimes. But you also need some time to yourself, don't you? To be able to refresh yourself by meditating on the things of God with your Maker. And then notice what else he says here. The older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands. Do you know that word love in Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 is not the word agape? Now it's used other times to talk about relationship, but here it's, he uses the word philodro, which is the idea of brotherly love. It's not the love that a man has for his wife in the intimate state, it is, a, it is the love that a woman is to have for her husband and he's to have for her as they work together as a team. There are times when the woman is going to be the person that gives the husband his best advice. The older women are to teach the younger women how to do that without being overwhelming and bossy and nagging and to be the type of person they need to be toward their husband as they both work together to sustain their family and to sustain themselves on their way to heaven. And notice this next one, to love their children. There's a natural love a mother has for her child, but this is a love that is taught. Teach us how to love our children. Our children aren't always lovable, are they? Nor are our spouses. But there is a relationship that exists that is a commanded relationship that we must show brotherly love. We must show love for those that, we are, that are our charges. Your children are your charge. And ladies, you need to be taught how to love your children properly. 
We live in a society, <clears throat> notice here, to love your children and also to be discreet, to be chaste, that's pure. And notice this idea of being discreet. That's knowing what's appropriate, not being boisterous or loud. Now folks, we live in a society today where the woman is encouraged to be bold, to be bossy, to be uh, condescending, to be overwhelming in her personality. And the older women are to teach the younger women to be pure-minded, to be discreet, to know when to be quiet, to know when to talk, to use some wisdom. And this idea of chase means keep your mind pure. Same thing that's used toward the man. To keep your mind where it needs to be. Somebody says, well, a woman it doesn't have a problem with her mind leading her astray. Yes, she does. And so she needs to be careful that she doesn't try to watch TV and watch the soap operas or watch the TV programs and use that as her older woman teaching her. No. You keep your mind pure. You keep your mind where it needs to be. And then notice this idea of being a keeper at home. In a society where husbands and wives are supposed to teach their daughters to run the company according to society or to do this or do that, it's not wrong for a woman to work outside the home. Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman was a very smart businesswoman, but she never let her home go in order to do that. She had priorities. A keeper at home. Thankfully, folks, we're living in a time where more and more women are choosing the better part of staying home and raising children. They've begun to understand that sometimes working is just not worth it. Now, sometimes a woman does need to go out into the community and work, but even then, she needs to understand her home, her family comes first. And we need to teach our daughters to understand that, that the home comes first. And God has so fashioned the woman that her touch at home is different from the man's touch. Have a whole lot of people today that say, well, you know, the man needs to take his turn at home. Well, okay, men ought to pick up their socks and help their wife and wash the dishes and do all kinds of things. No problem with that. But they do that not because they are better at it, because the wife is always most likely the best one in the house on that situation. But give her a break from time to time. But understand, women, appreciate that, but don't demand it of others. Don't say you have to take your turn. No. We need to all work together to help one another. But God has fashioned a lady, a, 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 a woman of God, to be a keeper at home first. And then other things can follow if need be. He says here that you need to behave yourself this way so the Word of God be not disrespected or blasphemed. So this says that the behavior or the comportment of a woman, no matter what state she's in, is to be one who has ordered her life in the ways of God. This type of woman will be a woman that will be qualified to be an elder's wife or a deacon's wife or a minister's wife because she has put herself to that. She'll be qualified to be a Bible class teacher, to be a godly Christian woman because she has set her heart to serve the Lord. She has done as the man. Her ways are ordered by the Lord. And folks, that's what it's all about. <clears throat> How do you get through the midlife years? <laughs> the same way you get through any other ones. You put the Lord at the very center and you walk in joy with your master each day. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, salvation is near, folks, and it gets nearer the longer we live in the flesh. Paul says this, do this knowing the time, and we'll go to the chart, that now it is high time to awake from your sleep. Go ahead to the chart, please. Now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night's far spent, the day's at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. All right? You and I need to put on the armor of light. We need to cast off the world of works of darkness and walk our life in our midlife years with joy and with 
great strength and great attitude as we go through our life, not with a defeatist spirit, not with a spirit that says, oh no, it's almost all over, I'm going to die. No, we're all going to die. We don't know when. So whatever stage of life we're in, what do we do? We live it day by day and we appreciate every moment of it. We have, we have, if we're raising children and going through those childhood years, we enjoy our children for they, we just have them for a short time. We enjoy the wife of our youth as long as we can, as many times as we can with them, every day, every hour, every moment, and with our brethren. We enjoy life. We have a great zest for it because this is the day the Lord has given us. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And that's the way we should live our lives there in these times and others. In 2 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23, since you purified your souls in obeying the truth, in sincere love of the brethren, then love one another fervently with a pure heart. These midlife years is when we begin to really blossom in this. We've learned it at a younger age, but now we're learning how to practice it in these midlife years. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the Word of God that lives and abides forever. The person that is what God wants them to be in the midlife years is a person who has learned to value this book, who has learned to love the law of God and to meditate upon it day and night and to learn to live it and, and go to it as his source material for how to navigate any time of life, any problem we confront, any joy we're faced with. How do I enjoy the things that God has blessed me with? without using them as idols. God tells us, doesn't He? It's all right to have things, but don't love them more than you love Him. Philippians 4, 4 and 5, admonition given to Christians. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, Paul says. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord's at hand. He's getting closer. And that time is coming. And we should, can look at it with dread or we can look at it with joy. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 through the Spirit. He says this, Our light affliction, you can go to the charts please, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. Whatever affliction you're in, whatever hardship, whatever burden you're bearing, in these midlife years, in the young years, in the child raising years, in your relationship with your wife, in your relationship with your brethren, whatever it is that's just about to take you apart, have the right outlook and perspective. By the midlife period of time you ought to be to a point where you have learned what's major and what's minor. Everything is not a big deal, folks. We live in a society where we have, as they say, a lot of drama mamas and a lot of drama daddies too, where we just make a big deal out of everything that happens. Well, if everything's a big deal, there is no big deal, is there? So we have to realize there are important things that we need to focus on, we need to solve, we need to work at, but we also need to learn that sometimes things take steps and that it takes a while to get some things settled and we can't do it overnight. Midlife years gives us patience, gives us long suffering and understanding so that we're able to take our time and learn as we go along and to think before we act, to reflect and to pray before we proceed. We are people that have learned that if we walk with God. And again, friends, if you're walking without God in these years tonight, you need to get busy and stop doing the things the same old way and getting the same old results. Enough's enough, isn't it? Stop it. Stop living a sinful life. Stop thinking all the answers are in a bottle or in some booze or in some, some type of drug that you're taking or in some type of worldly lifestyle. You've been doing that and it's giving, getting you nowhere. You're where you are because you've been doing the same old thing, thinking that the answer will change. You're going to get the same result every time. Sadness, division, animosity, hardship, difficulties, challenges, sadness, 
in your quiet moments. Somebody says, oh no, I don't go through any of that. And I, no, -uh. when you're quiet and you look at your life and you look at yourself, you know that what I'm telling you is true. You don't like yourself. You don't like who you are. So you need to stop, reflect, and know that God's ways are best and put Him first. In Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. He was looking forward to his life every day. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, Paul says to the Corinthians, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, watch this, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. So what is he saying here? God is in the God of mercy and of comfort, and He comforts us so we can comfort others, and so that we can come through trials and troubles with our God and be victorious on the other side of them. You know, one of the, one of the points that they teach you in leadership training out in the world, in the business world, is that a true leader understands that he cannot lead properly unless he serves. He serves his employees. He does not bark at them and be a dictator. Oh, there are people that do that and still succeed somehow, but they are not the type of people that are going to stay in, in good business for very long because they are not going to have anybody who wants to work for them. But you'll have people standing in line to work for a servant, someone that knows what it's like to serve. The midlife times are when we should have honed those skills to where we know what is best and we are applying it. Now, another thing we do in the midlife years is we provide for our own. That can be challenging, but it can also be an adventure. If anyone does not provide for his own here, and especially for those of his own household, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 8, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's pretty bad, isn't it? So that's a big responsibility. Now I can look at that and say, boy, that's a lot of pressure. Or I can say, thank you, God, for trusting me enough to put that much confidence in me that I can do that. I can do that. If you believe in me that much, Lord, I can do this. Again, by our mid-years, we hopefully have honed that and believed that and seen that work time and again to where we know that we can do what God told us to do. Now, Henry Ford said, and I'm going to use a quote, it is usual to associate age with years only because so many men and women somewhere along in what some people call middle age, they just simply stop trying. What he went on to say was people sometimes get to middle age and think that they have no more new ideas. They have no more ways to grow. They've done it all. They've been there. They can't do any more. And so they settle in for mediocre. You know, that can happen to you spiritually. As you get to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, particularly chapter 3, we see the church at Laodicea who had settled for mediocre. They were only going to hold what they had. They weren't going to grow anymore. Well, that's, that's a dead end, folks, because when you're at that point, you're backing up. And so in midlife, we need to understand that we need to put ourselves to the task of moving forward, always remembering what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Excellence is what God expects of all of us. He wants us to do our very best, whatever that best is. It might not, my best is not your best, but I have a best, and you do too. God wants you to do that. And He wants you to continue to challenge yourself to grow, not only in spiritual stature, but also in the things of this life. Don't give up. Don't think you've reached the end and that it'll never get any better. Challenge yourself. Do something that you've never done before that's right to do. 
grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We also need to understand for midlife that this world's passing away. Paul says it this way, 1 Corinthians 7, 29-31, This I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as those that had none, and those who weep as those that do not weep, those who rejoice as those that do not, did, did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of the world is passing away. What Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 7 is in view of the present distress, and he was saying there that things are changing, and it's going to be different, and it's not going to be the same as it always has. Now, you know and I know, if you've been watching the news at all, we're in a time of elections, and everybody's talking about what if this happens, and what if that happens, and what if, you know what, if we're serving God and doing what He tells us to do, if the whole world fell apart tomorrow, what would the Christian do? Well, that question was asked, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? That was asked during Jeremiah's time. If all the foundations are destroyed, how does that change a Christian? Well, it certainly changes his life like it does everybody. But if the Christian has always been putting God first, he'll still put God first. If he has set the course of his life, no matter what happens, the death of a loved one, the, any type of challenge we run into with our job, we're still going to serve God first. He's put, that's just not going to change. If the foundations be destroyed, the righteous still do righteousness. And that's what we need to understand in midlife. That's our course. Joshua 24, verse 25, what do we see there? Joshua said there, as for me and my house, we will serve God. That course was set early on in his life with his home. We're serving God. We see that with Joshua at 40. We see it with him at 80 later on and also with Caleb. They, have decide, they had decided to serve the Lord in their midlife. And then as they got to be 80 in their older years, they still were serving God. You see what they had chosen? They had set their course. They didn't know what life would throw at them in detail, but they knew this, I will take God and He will be first no matter what. Now friends, that will take you through whatever stage of life you're in. Well, we're going to take a break for just a moment, and we want you to think about where you are and what stage you're in in your life. What are you doing? The average person today will live to be about 27, will live about 27,375 days. And if you're 50 years old, you have 9,000 days left, roughly. If you're 65, you have 3,650 days left. If you live a time span of 74 to 76 years. So where are you? I'm, I'm past middle age, according to that. It does help us to number our days. We see there that the, we're told to number our days in Psalm 90 and verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days. And that means to not only know how many we have left, but to do what we can with what we know we have right now, and that's today. Live life day by day. Someone said, and it was a motto of one of the weight loss people years ago, inch by inch it's a cinch, and yard by yard it's really hard. Well, God wants us to know that we can't do anything about tomorrow because we haven't lived it yet. Can't do anything about yesterday because it's done. What we can do is live this life to the best of our ability. Let's look at a successful man for just a moment who in his midlife lost his life. In a 2005 commencement speech at Stanford University, Steve Jobs said this, One of the secrets to my success has been to remind myself every day that I'm going to die, even when I didn't know I was. Just a few years later, he passed away at the age of 56. But in those 56 years, he accomplished more than almost anyone that's ever lived in the business world. In Hebrews 9, verse 27, it says there that you will die. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. 
in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, all has been said. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Well, Titus 2, we just read it. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Older women, reverent in behavior, not gossips, not enslaved to wine, teaching what's good. Well, what's the value in getting older if you hadn't got your priorities set? Again, Job 12 and verse 12, it says here, Wisdom is with aged men, and with length of days, understanding. Now that's a, that's a truism. We all know people that are older and in old age, and they are just not wise. The hoary head is to be honored, but those that are of a hoary head or a gray hair need to understand that they have a responsibility to be righteous. Not all hoary-headed people are righteous. So we need to watch that and make sure we're what we need to be. Old age, and most of us won't, won't admit that, that we're older. Well, how do, you, how do you determine what old age is? My dad's 95. Is he old in some ways? Is he young in some ways? Is he middle age in some ways? Yes. One thing he has learned is that life takes a sense of humor, that you need to learn not to be flippant, but to realize that sometimes you act in a funny way and you ought to be able to laugh at yourself. And that is true in any stage of your life. You need to understand that Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says there's going to be some things that are going to happen to your body as you get older. Now you may or may not have read this, but did you know that God defined in detail what happens to our bodies? In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, if you'll look there, Ecclesiastes 12. Well, after saying, remember your Creator in your youth, He goes on in verse 2 to describe old age. He says here, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened nor the clouds return after the rain in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they're few and those that look out of the windows are darkened. Well, and the doors are shut in the streets, the sound of the grinding is low and you rise up at the voice of the bird and that the daughters of music will be brought low. And when they shall be afraid, that which is high, and fear those which are in the way, and the almond tree will flourish, the grasshopper will be a burden. Desire shall fail, because man goes to his long home, and the mourner goes about the street. Well, ask yourself something. What's he talking about? Well, Psalm, the psalmist says in Psalm 37 and verse 25 that as we get older, some things are realized. David said it this way, I've been young and now I'm old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken and I've never seen their seed begging bread. What's he saying there? Righteousness is the way to live. But understand that we are not put here to last forever. Paul goes on, or he goes on to say, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul says, I've fought a good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. So there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not just to me only, but to all those who love His appearing. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6-8. through eight. The challenges of old age are many. Now, I'm not there yet. I've decided that old age is always going to be 10 years older than I am. So I'll always stay middle age. No, I won't. I will convince myself I'm not there, but that doesn't mean I'm not there. Sometimes in old age, we face disrespect. And more and more so in this, in this life. Older people somehow are, sometimes are described in our society as just doddering old fools. 
But in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2, the Lord's attitude toward those that are older, He says, You shall rise before the gray-headed one and honor the presence of the old man, and you'll fear God because I am the Lord. He places His existence as God on how we treat the older. You'll rise before the gray head. And we know that there are some people that are running for office even now that say the best way to take care of the old people is to let them realize they are without value and so we need to get rid of them or just let them die. You've lived your 70 or 80 years and you're not financially viable anymore for our investments. So you just die and go on. We'll see you. We're going to give you some pain pills and that's it. We're not going to let you have operations like you need to have. We're done with you as a society, so, so go on. That's not what God said. The honor of the older was tied to the belief in God like you should. Well, friends, we should not be alarmed that the situation has so di diminished in our society that men are calling for the older people to die. We've been killing the younger people for years. We talked about this the other night that 50 million or more than that now at 60 over 60 million babies have been killed in this country since 1973 through abortions and now we find people saying well it's not viable for society to have to finance older people as they get older well so let's just let them die let's just kill all the old people why should we be surprised Many people are not even bothered by an abortion today, and that's sad. But what about life? Is life precious? Should we, should we honor both the child in the womb and the old, head, the old gray headed person that's in our society? Yes, we should. God said that's right to do. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23, young people made fun of the prophet of God. And the Lord called out a bear to take care of that problem. He turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them, and female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 youths. I bet they thought long and hard. What was God saying? Remember what He said about the gray head? Stand up when He comes in the room. They weren't doing that. They were disobeying the law. So God corrected them. Well, facing disrespect, but what about living in the past? If we're not careful, I've done this, and you've probably done this too, if you are a little bit gray or a little bit bald. You probably thought, talked about the good old days. Let me ask you something. When you were living those, in those good old days, did they seem like good old days? No, somebody before you was talking about their good old days. And they were talking about the Depression. That wasn't a good time but they were talking about the things they remember that were different. You know, we need to recognize, we learn lessons from history, and we need to tell our history. We need to pass that on to the younger. But we also need to recognize that we live in the present. And we need to recognize that we have work to do. Because you're older, because you're gray-headed, because you are on retirement, does not mean that you are retired from God or that you're retired from doing things, or that you're useless in any way. Get up every day, okay? Get up and do something every day. In Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10, do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you don't inquire wisely about this. You can't do anything about the former days. You can learn lessons from them, but you can't change them. So just go on and say, okay, this happened, learn from it, and let's move on. One thing I've learned as I've gotten older, we should say, as we get older, and that is not to do this, but do this. Don't give up. Keep on getting up. Well, what about loneliness and neglect? Now, this is a big problem because there are young people that don't realize that some older people are lonely. Loneliness when you're young is horrible. Loneliness in your midlife is horrible. And loneliness when you get older is horrible. When you hear every tick of the clock, when the only thing that gives you any type of company is when the mailman comes. 
That's a lonely life. And that can get depressing, can it? Nobody calls me. My kids don't call me. My friends don't call me. My brethren don't call me. That's a bad place to be. You ever tried to put yourself in the place of an older person? Do you know any older people? Do you know, have you ever noticed how their life lights up when a child comes in the room and hugs them? You ever notice that? How many people do you know that you could lift up their day if you just go sit with them and listen to them or talk to them? It is a highlight of an older person's life when they have company or they have someone to call them and say, how are you today? You know, in the body of Christ, many of us who call ourselves Christians, we have a big problem with neglecting our older people. And they can get to feeling like they don't count anymore. No, they do. A person who has lived a righteous life and is full of wisdom and is older and wants to teach you and wants to talk to you, the, re the attitude of the younger should be, I will listen to the older. Many times in the body of Christ, in business meetings and situations like that, when the older person speaks up and is pretty well overwhelmed by the younger ideas, that's a bad place to be. That's not what God says. Older people have some wisdom, folks, and we need to cherish it. We need to seek it because one day we're going to be there and we're going to want somebody to listen to us. But if every society is built like Solomon built his kingdom on and only listening to the younger advisors, that kingdom will fall just like Solomon's did. Listen to the older and go visit them. When my wife and I were raising our three boys, we raised them away from their grandparents. Not, not by choice, but just because my father preaches and he was at different places and her folks were in California and Mexico and all of that. So our kids were not able to have and older people or a, a set of grandparents that they would see every day. So what we did, we tried to make the older people in the congregations where we worshiped, the older people were their grandparents. We would take them to visit them. We would take them to just sit down and listen to them. And you know what? We found out real quick that that helped us a whole lot more than it helped those people that we went and visited. We learned a lot and we grew to cherish them. And those, those uh, older people and the appreciation you have for older people, you know, there are several things we didn't do with our kids, but one thing they seem to, all of them, enjoy, and that's older people. They see the value of the old person and talking with them and listening to them and not neglecting them and thinking, okay, your time's over, old guy, scoot over. No, don't push them out the way. Don't lead them and don't treat them in a way that's disrespectful. We should honor the old head. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 4, we are regulated in the scripture. If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now I know that sometimes there are there's different lines of thought on putting our, our older people in a home. Sometimes that is necessary. There is no way around it. You can't take care of them properly and so you get them the best care you can. And that's, that, that does happen. But that being said, let's not be the type of people who want to get our old people out of our hair and we want to pay them out of our lives. And so we put them somewhere and we never go see them. We never talk to them. We never visit them. We put them somewhere and let strangers care for them. Again, even if you do have to put your, your parent in an, older, in an older age facility, don't neglect them. Don't not write them a card or a letter. Go and talk with them, sit with them, and be regular about it. Again, repay your parents. They put up with a lot from you. You should be willing to do the same.
Requite them is the word. Well, Moses said this, Honor your father and your mother. That was one of the commandments. You remember that? He went on to say, He that curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. If a man says to his father and mother, What profit you might have received from me as Corban, that is, a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything. Well, for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Jesus said that in Matthew 7, verse 30, or verse 10 through 13. You know what people were doing? I've, I, well, I can't give to God because I've put money aside to take care of my parents. Well, now wait just a minute. You should have recognized that your first responsibility is to God, and you also have an op opportunity to understand that you should take care of your parents, but you also should take care of the things of God too. What were they doing? They were, they were using their service to their parents as an excuse not to do all that God told them to do. Manage yourself better, be better stewards is the answer to that. In Proverbs 17 and verse 6, children's children are the crown of old men. My wife and I have seven grandchildren, and I want to tell you that that's true. They are the crown of old men. I'm so proud of all of them. They are the glory. The glory of children is their father. And you hope that as you get older, that as a father, as a mother, that you have been and are the type of person that your children still want to be around. Now, I'm going to talk to the older people just a minute. Sometimes we wonder why our kids don't want to be around us. You know what? Maybe we're just hateful. Did you ever think about that? Maybe you're just a cranky old coot, and you need to get your life better, and you need to get your attitude right, and be somebody that your, your kids want their kids to be around. You're cheating yourself of a wonderful life if you're just cranky all the time. You need to be a type of person that's easy to get along with. You don't need to be the type of person that's always, when your children are trying to help you, that you're always in their face yelling at them and kicking them out of the house and all that type of thing. No, that's no life. No wonder your kids want to get you, get, get you out of, them, of their life. Still not right, but you need to behave in a way to where people understand that you're lovable and they want to be around you. Well, the, one of the other things that we face in the, in the challenges of old age is aging gracefully. There are some older people that don't seem old. Do you ever notice that? They just don't seem old because they are aging with grace, okay? And what that says is that they have learned to understand that life is, even though we're nearer to death as we get older, we have not stopped living. And as we get older, we should recognize we have more to do, not less. Time goes by very quickly as you get older, much quicker than it did when you were younger. And you've got some days left. What are you doing with them? Have you decided to just crawl in a corner and melt or mold because you've got some age on you? No, you've got a lot you can do. John chapter 21 and verse 18, when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you don't even wish. Somebody's going to carry you around maybe one day when you get older, but put that day off as long as you can and carry yourself around as long as you can. Don't give up. Notice I was at the gym the other day and there was a man there, found out he was 101 years old. He's at the gym. You know, God bless him for doing that. You know, He hadn't quit. Now, he was bent, and he was brittle, and he was old, and he was slow, but he was there, and he was getting up and doing what he could. Folks, I tell you what, I hope that I'm like that when I get older. Don't you? That you don't just sit down and quit. Oh, you may have to go to therapy to be able to lift your foot up that high, but you've done something that day. You've challenged yourself. There's a lot to do. Don't give up. In Job chapter 12 and verse 12, even when people don't want wisdom, offer it anyway. Notice in Job chapter 12 and verse 12, wisdom is with the aged, and with length of days comes understanding. 
you understand, many of us understand what socialism is, but many young people think socialism is a page on Facebook. Well, we understand what that is. We learned some things. We've lived through some things. We have heard some things. We've come through a Cold War. We know what that is. We know it's not good. And that's just one thing. We know that the ways of God are right. We've lived long enough to know and see that proven, that the righteous are never forsaken, nor is their seed begging bread, because God takes care of His own. We've lived long enough to see that, share that with other kids, and let them know that no matter what they do, to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first is the best life that there is, bar none. Evangelize that way, older people. And to those of us who are younger, don't think the, younger, the older people can't learn. We have a Bible class where I'm preaching now with about nine to ten older people in a facility, and they all are bright, and they are all are contributing, and they're all looking forward to the next class. And they study their Bibles, they learn, and they listen. And one of them said the other day, I'm, I'm concerned about these things because I'm just about there. Well, there you go, you know. He's doing what he can. He's still studying his Bible. That's awesome. Many of you are doing the same thing that are older. Well, in Proverbs 16, verse 31, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Remember what we said earlier? That you have an obligation to be what God wants you to be. You have an obligation to do that. You have an obligation to be righteous so people will listen to you and do what and do what you've said. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32 says this, You shall stand up before the gray head, honor the face of an old man, and fear God. Psalm 71, notice the psalmist was worried about being discarded when he got old because he says this, Do not discard me in my old age, and do not forsake me when my strength fails. A lot of kids need to read that, don't they? Caring for their older people. In Psalm 90, again, teach us to number our days. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, life is a gracious gift, folks. That's what we've learned in this whole study. In Psalm 91, verses 15 through 16, longer life is a great gift from God. Do you honor life as you should? Do you look upon it as a gift from God each day that you live? Abraham was 175 years old when he died. And it says he lived to be a good old age. There's no indication that Abraham ever s slowed down, is there? He just kept going till he wore out, you know? We just keep going till we stop and then it's over. And whatever time that comes, in our midlife, in our early age, or as we get older, we're ready to be with God. That's the most important thing in the world. Now, lifespans have decreased. Have you noticed that in the Bible? The oldest man who ever lived was 969. So, middle age for Methuselah would have been 430 years old, 440 years old, you know? Now that's a long time, isn't it? Can you imagine being at midlife at 440 years old? But that was Methuselah. Abraham, his midlife would have been about 80 years old, 85. Moses died at 120. And it is said of Moses that he, you know, he didn't show his age. Today our span of life is 70, maybe 80 years. If by reason of strength, maybe we'll get a little longer than that, but mainly today we're, we're at midlife about 35, about 40, 45 maybe, depending on how, when you die. And we don't know when we'll die, do we? So as we've studied through these stages of life, we find out, we've found out that some things are very becoming for a, an infant that are not becoming for an old person. Some things are becoming for an infant that are not becoming for a young father or someone in midlife. So let's act our age. 
but also remember to appreciate the age where you are. Appreciate your youth, appreciate your old age, and appreciate your midlife and your young adulthood. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Rejoice. That's the advice of the wisest man that ever lived. Barzillai is a man that most people don't know. But he is, everything that's said about him is pretty good. In 2 Samuel 19, 34 and 35, go read that when you get a chance. But it talks about a man that was 80 that David was going to, going to give a lot of riches to. And he said, no, I'm old, I'm 80, I'll never live long enough to enjoy them. So you give them to my kids. Go ahead and give it to someone that will enjoy it. Now, we brought up Ecclesiastes 12 a minute ago, and I want to read some things to you from that passage. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and verse 2 and 3, you have your Bibles? The sun or the light or the moon or the stars are not darkened. Okay, you got that? And the clouds return after the rain. And notice what he's saying there. This is when your sight and your teeth start going. Verses 4 and 5 talk about the day, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3 talks about the time when your teeth are going. But you have the loss of sight, you have the loss of teeth, you have the loss in verse 4 and 5 of your hearing. Although you can't hear what somebody says to you across the room, but you can hear that bird early in the morning tweeting and it wakes you up. See? Kind of strange, isn't it? The loss of hearing, the loss of mobility, the loss of your sleep and your muscles, and your sexual desire begins to wane, the loss of health, self-image, the loss of importance. Oftentimes you're ignored, there's a tendency to be helpless and to nurture that to get attention and to fear loneliness more than anything. Well, how do you get over the, some of these. If you fear loneliness, quit pushing people away when you're younger. I know of some situations where people pushed away their, their families. They pushed away everybody because they were too busy enjoying themselves. And then when they got older, they said, why doesn't somebody come around? Sometimes it's because the young people are the problem and sometimes it's because the older people are. How you act in your youth determines how you'll be treated when you get older. How you have treated others will be how they will treat you. That's an axiom. That's a certainty. Also, your tendency to be helpless. Again, like a child, you will use your helplessness as a crutch for attention. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't long for the day when you need help getting up and getting down and changing your, your diaper as a child. Don't long for that day, folks. It'll come soon enough, possibly. And be, maybe you're fortunate enough not to ever have that happen. But don't wish for the day when it will. Don't seek attention by pretending that things are wrong with you that are not because you're you're just crying wolf, and you taught your kids not to do that, so don't do it with them. Understand that as you get older. Psalm 71, verse 9, remember what we read? Do not cast me off when I get older, when my strength is gone. Well, somebody said, you painted a pretty bleak picture of this getting old business. Well, no, I haven't. Hold on a minute. What's the advantage of aging? Wow. Well, one is, if you're aging, you're alive aren't you? That's a great advantage. I'm able to serve God another day. And I've been doing that all my life, so I'm getting closer to heaven every day I live. Let me get up today. I'm getting closer to heaven. Keep your outlook good. Perspective. Also, as you get older, if you've aged properly, you'll get more respect from people. And economically, if you've done what you should with your funds, you'll be pretty, good, pretty well off. And guess what? When you get older, you get senior discounts. Hamrix has sale day. You know, you get better prices on things. You get free coffee at McDonald's. 
go down there, you know. Somebody said, if it's free, for me, it's for me. Well, if somebody's honoring you that way, do that. If your spouse is alive, enjoy your retirement years together as a team. One of the saddest things that you see is when people work all their lives to get older together and to be able to do things together only to put it off so long that one of them passes and they don't want to do anything anymore. Enjoy your time together. If you have funds that you put together, enjoy them. Somebody says, I want my kids to have them. Well, okay, put some stuff aside for the kids and spend every dime of the rest of it. It's yours. And let them make their own. That doesn't mean that you leave them penniless. But it means you need to enjoy your life together. And maybe you don't want to travel. May, or maybe you, maybe you just want to go to a lot of movies together. That's fine. But do something together with your spouse if you still are blessed to have them. The advantages of experience and knowledge come with age. You know, my grandmother passed when she was 92, but she was smarter than any woman I ever knew, and she only went to the ninth grade. You know that? But boy, was she smart. You know, she knew Latin. They taught Latin in the one-room school she went into. Well, she was a smart woman. She didn't have a degree, but she was smart. And she would just, she could just open her mouth and it was knowledge and wisdom. And you're sitting there going, wow, you are awesome. She never thought she was awesome. She was just Nolly, N-O-L-L-I-E. But she was something and I miss her. The aging process can't be stopped, folks, except by death. So. Understand you're going to get older. Understand you're going to hurt sometimes. If you've got genetic problems like arthritis, you know, you can have it cut out in different places, but the bottom line is your genetics are your genetics. You're going to hurt. Maybe some of your fingers will get crooked. Maybe you won't always have pretty fingernails. Maybe you'll have hair fall out like I do. That's happening. It's not, I can't stop that. Somebody said, well, you could, you could get implants. No, I'm pretty proud of every, every gray hair I have, every white hair. Some one brother called it service stripes. And the parts of my head that are showing, I'm okay with that. I'm not so vain, I think I have to have hair to be a person. I've learned, long, learned different. Well, the aging process continues, no matter how you look outwardly, do you know that? You swell up and you shrink, That's, that happens. You get fat, you get thin. That all happens, and some of it's of your own making and some of it isn't. But you just do the best you have with what you have and you try to stay as healthy as possible and you take whatever medicines you need, but don't take the medicines you don't. Don't numb yourself into old age. In 1 Peter chapter, 1 Timothy 5, respect the older as you're commanded to do, he told Timothy. Now, older people have a lot of credentials. They've lived to bury their parents. They've been taken on to the trials of life. They've struggled with them themselves. And God, by the way, in His church has a place for older people. He wants godly older people to step up and be pillars. That's what elders are to do, those who are older in the church. Pillars in local churches. He doesn't want them to go get a Winnebago and go around the country and be useless to the local church. They hit the road and no one knows where they are. Enjoy the fruit of your labor, but put the kingdom first, folks. The church needs you. Be sound in the faith, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. The older there are to be temperate, dignified, and sensible. And that replaces their youthful recklessness and impetuous, impetuousness and thoughtlessness. Be sound in the faith as you get older. And by the way, those of you who are, who are old soldiers in the kingdom, thank you for your service. We say that to the military all the time. But they're spiritual soldiers, folks, that deserve our thank yous. They fought many a battle. They've made, a, made it possible for us to be as prosperous as we are spiritually today in the church. They've stood at times where it wasn't easy to stand. They've made many sacrifices with their own families. 
so that we can enjoy the blessings that we have today. Moses was 80 when God called him. Noah was 400 when the Lord called him to do what he should. Caleb was 80. John Wesley's life is recorded this way. This is a story taken from his, his biography. He preached 40,000 sermons, John Wesley did. He wrote 400 books. He was fluent in 10 languages. At 83, he was annoyed that he couldn't read and write for more than 15 hours a day without his eyes hurting. At 86, he finally admitted that he couldn't preach more than twice a day. He admitted at 87 that he was more prone to linger in bed until 5.30, which was a lazy way to live, he considered. 87 years old, thinking if he slept after 5.30, he had wasted his day. That's what a great outlook, right? Don't sleep your life away. Get up. Do something. Do something. There's so much the older can offer and can do, folks. Get busy. Look for souls to save. And if you're in a, a facility that's over for older people, become an evangelist in that home where you are. Have a Bible study. Call your friends in. Do not stop short of the goal line. You remember watching the Olympics several years ago when somebody died right at the goal line, right at the finish line of a race? They were within feet of crossing the line and they dropped. There's other people who have had cramps that have crawled across finish lines. And although they didn't come in first, they were recognized as winners. And a great example to all of us. Why? Because when the finish line was so near in sight, they did not stop. They kept going. And for the first time in our society, folks, there are more people that are 65 and older than there are that are teenagers. First time. It's a great opportunity for older people to mold a generation, a new generation. Don't lose sight of that. Teach your children as the old song goes and teach them well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the years that you have been with us on this program while I've been honored to be there. And I also want to take a, take a little bit of time to thank the church at Newton for the opportunity to preach on this program. I cherish it. And I will always remember these days. Well, we'll come back in just a moment, but we want to go and listen once more to what's coming, what a treat you have in store with Brother Deaton. We'll go to that right now. Stephen Deaton and I'll be working with the Newton Church of Christ on the Word and Sword Bible Study Program. I plan to continue on in the same work that Stan Adams has done for many years in proclaiming the gospel of Christ and directing you to the Word of God as the sole and final authority in all things pertaining to our beliefs and practices. I will also appeal to you to submit to the Lord in your life that you may have fellowship with Him. We will also use the sword of the Spirit to defend the gospel of Christ against the doctrines and commandments of men. Some of the changes you'll notice about the TV program is the new studio that we'll be in, but also we plan to have shorter segments during the program focused on specific topics and covering multiple topics in each program. We also want to encourage you to go to our Facebook page to submit questions in addition to using the phone number to call in and to ask questions or sending questions via email. Something I want to do, though, before I leave you is to leave you with this thought. Did you know that you can understand the Word of God, the will of God, as the Apostle Paul understood the Word of God? In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
He says, you can understand like I understand. But there are a lot of people these days who don't think we can understand the Bible. They think it's too confusing. It's too complex. It's too difficult. There are others who think, well, certain people can understand the Bible, maybe certain religious leaders, and they need to tell us what the Word of God says. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you and I can understand the Word of God just like the Apostle Paul did. When you think about it, God loves the whole world. He loves every man. He loves every woman. He loves every child. And because God loves us, he wants us to be redeemed. And the way we know how to be redeemed, the way that we would come to know him and have a relationship with him is by knowing his will. And so he revealed his will in a way that we can understand it in his providence. He has protected it down through the centuries and seen that it spread all over the world in the languages that men speak. We have it in our language that we can know and understand the will of God. Because again, God loves us and God wants us to be redeemed. And so I encourage you to read your Bible daily. Study it, meditate upon it, and live by it. And also join us here on the first and third Tuesdays of the month from 8 to 10 p.m. as we study the Word of God, that we may study it together and understand the will of God. I look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to studying with you. Thank you, Stephen. And we look forward to your, you taking the program uh, starting March the 17th. That's the second or the third Tuesday of this month. Remember again to set your clocks forward for Sunday, if you will. And in parting, someone had said, what would your parting words be? What would you preach? Well, if I had one sermon to preach, I'd preach about Jesus. I would preach about the plan of salvation, hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, and being faithful unto death, and wearing yourself out serving the Lord. I'd also be preaching and talking about preach the word, not your opinion. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Anything less than that, folks, is not gospel preaching. And so we need to abide by that, and I'm sure Brother Deaton will do that as, uh, as we've tried to do during our time. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the privilege of being in your homes for over eight years. I really appreciate it, and I am honored by it, and I thank you for that. Understand that it is not the man that makes the difference. It is the Word that is going to change lives and make you a better person. Study it, learn it, obey it, and go to heaven one day. Look forward to seeing you, if not here, in heaven. And thank you so much. Good evening.